Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Vision. Can you all hear me? Okay, folks, so now what I'd like you to do is, would you please stand up? And I won't like, what I'd like you to do is take very deep, very slow breaths. Now reach up your hand and try to touch the ceiling, you know, really push, push at it. And continue taking deep, slow breaths. Now twist slowly to the left, your left. And continue taking deep, slow breaths. Now twist to the right. Continue taking deep, slow breaths. Okay, folks, sit down. Now, in case any of you are wondering why I made you do that, it's because I kind of forgot my opening remarks and I needed some time to re <coughs> recap. <laughs> <coughs> this really is an awesome occasion. And in fact, I'm going to do something that I have never done before, which is I'm going to share some material with you which I have never done in a public forum. I've done it in my programs, and even then only to select persons, but I feel so comfortable with the level of awareness here and the openness that I'm going to be sharing material which I've never done in public before. <clears throat> so if you're looking for something which is a paradigm, paradigm buster, you're gonna get it. So what I would like you to do is please don't listen to my talk. Please experience it. Relate it back to your belief system, relate it back to how you view life, and see how it completely changes the way in which you function. Uh, <clears throat> I had a course which I taught in many business schools. It's called Creativity and Personal Mastery. I no longer teach it at any business school. I teach it privately. And right in the syllabus, <coughs> the, what I state is, this is a program which will profoundly change your life. And if it does not profoundly change your life, then we will both have failed. And I can tell you that you take my program, you do the exercises conscientiously, it will change your life. And the reason I can make that so statement so confidently is because of where I draw my material. This is not ego speaking, you know, this is not Sri Kumar Rao stuff that I'm changing, <clears throat> I'm sharing with you. What has happened is I have borrowed freely from great spiritual masters, and they strode the earth at different times, they belonged to different <clears throat> traditions, and they intimately understood the human condition. And they understood human predicaments, and they came up with solutions. And these solutions have been tested over millennia, and they absolutely work. What I have done is I have taken these tremendously powerful teachings, I have stripped them of religious, cultural, and other baggage. I've adapted them so that they are acceptable to very intelligent people in a post-industrial society. And in that context, they have been tested in some very trying environments, top business schools, major corporations, and they absolutely work. So that's why I can make that statement so confidently. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to tell you a little bit about how it came out, <clears throat> why it works, and I'm actually going to share some of those, experience, uh, some of those exercises with you. Fair enough? Great. One of the ways in which my program is different, by the way, is that you don't get to decide you want to take it. Typically, when you have an executive program 
or any kind of program, the way it works is you decide, gee, how much does it cost and am I able and willing to pay it? Two, where is it going to be held and can I make it? And if the answer to both of those is yes, then okay, you're in. Uh, my programs are different. You can't decide you want to take it. You have to apply and be accepted. An application is deliberately a cumbersome pain in the backside. And the reason for that is very simple. I can't change your life. I have difficulty enough changing my life. So what I can do is I can share with you some very powerful tools but they will only work if you are motivated enough if you really want to engage with it. If you don't have that and you attend my program, nothing's going to happen. And if nothing happens, then it's a waste of your time. But as, as important as it being a waste of your time is you'll be a drag on everybody else. And it's much better not to have you around if you're not willing to engage. So that's the reason I have, as I said, a cumbersome application process. But if, on the other hand, you are engaged and you go through then quite literally, magic happens. So, <clears throat> let me ask you a question. How many of you, at some turning point in your life, and the two most important turning points are your birthday and New Year's Day, have gone something like, you know, from now on things are going to be different. I'm going to eat healthy, exercise regularly, uh, stop procrastinating, and if you've done that, how long did it last? A week is actually pretty good. You know there is a reason why exercise clubs sign up so many more people than they can handle in December? They know come January 15, there'll be plenty of space on the treadmill sign-up sheets. <clears throat> the reason it doesn't happen is most of us try to bring about change by an effort of will. Darn it, I am going to stop eating so much. I am going to quit smoking. Think about it. Is it or is it not true that when you try to bring about change, you try to bring about change by an effort of will? When you try to bring about change by an effort of will, you are doing violence to yourself. Odds are pretty good you won't succeed. But even if you have a very strong will, and therefore you do pull it off for any length of time, you will probably pay a price that you're not very happy about. So you stop smoking cold turkey, you eat too much, you put on weight. You starve yourself into uh, losing weight, you ruin your disposition, and relations with your family and your co-workers. Anytime you try to bring about profound personal change by an effort of will, you do violence to yourself, you're unlikely to succeed, and even if you do, odds are pretty good that there will be a, a side effect that you're not very happy about. In my program, change happens, and it lasts. And the reason it does is because it does not come about by an effort of will. It comes about because you re-examine how you view the world. And as you change your mental models, you quite literally become a different person. And as you become a different person, your behavior changes automatically. So, given that as a background, there are some building blocks which are very important, so let me lay them out for you. And the first building block is something called mental chatter. And mental chatter is an internal monologue that you have going on in your head all the time. It begins right up from the time you get up in the morning, is with you right now, through the day, is with you when you <clears throat> go to bed at night, and sometimes it's so loud that it prevents you from going to sleep. And if you're familiar with that, you know the thing that goes, okay, what time is it? What do I have to do? It's a beautiful day outside. Maybe I should go out to the beach. Do I really want to attend this session? Uh, I've learned a great deal already, and you know, the guy is bald, and bald people never have anything useful to say. <laughs> that kind of thing is mental chatter. It is so much a part of our lives that we ignore it, try to suppress it. We live our lives in spite of it. Deal with it. It's like an unwelcome relative who lands up at your place and you can't throw him out. So you make do with him. That is a big mistake. And the reason it's a big mistake is that by ignoring our mental chatter, we pretty much let it rule the roost. And 
The important thing for you to know is that you create your world with your mental chatter. Let me repeat that. You create your world with your mental chatter. You think you live in a real world. You don't. You live in a construct. And if you've seen The Matrix, the original Matrix, number of you have. If you don't, I would strongly recommend you go out and rent it from your video library or buy it and watch it. We all live in the matrix. We do not live in a real world. We live in a construct. It's something we made ourselves. And this, by the way, is a hugely liberating concept. Because if what you live in is the real world, you're screwed. There's nothing you can do about it. Grin and bear it. But if what you live in is a world, a real world, then there is stuff you can do about it. If it is not working, there are parts of it that you can deconstruct, you can build it again in a fashion more to your liking, and you have immense flexibility. How you do that is a big part of what my program is all about. Let me move on to the next concept, and the next concept is something called a mental model. And a mental model is a notion that you have that this is the way the world works. And all of you have models. You've got dozens of models, maybe hundreds of models. You've got a model for how to find a person to marry, how do I bring up children, how do I pick a restaurant to eat at. Did you attend the life book session yesterday? Yeah. Wasn't that awesome? Yeah. So how many of you decided, gee, you know, that would be really helpful if I went out and did it? Okay. What you've just done is you've created a mental model. And in that mental model, here is something which I find useful. And if I go out and do this and subject myself to the four days, then good things are going to happen to me. That is a model. And by the way, that's a model that I formed too. I was talking to Laura Silva, who <clears throat> is also a good friend of mine. And she said, are you going to go? And I looked at her and said, yeah, I'm going to go. Are you going to go? And she said, yes, I'm going to go. So we are going to go, we're just not going to go in the time frame that uh, they mentioned because life is crazy for the next few months. But somewhere along the time, I'm going to carve out the time to do it probably next year. But understand that what I have just done is I've created the same mental model that many of you have created. This is not reality. It is a model. Now, there is nothing at all wrong in any sense, wrong in quotes, with a mental model. What is wrong is that you don't recognize that you have a mental model. You think this is the way the world works. Wrong. This is not the way the world works. This is your model of the way the world works. Now, many of us get into the habit of saying, oh, gee, you know, okay, maybe, you know, this guy saying something, I should think about it. Is this model true or false? And we always get caught in this trap of, is it true or false? That is the wrong question to ask yourself. Don't ask yourself whether a particular mental model is true or false, because ultimately they are all false. Everything that I'm going to share with you today is false. This is one of the things I bring up early, by the way, because in the audiences I speak before, there are many type A driven personalities. MBAs are the most type A driven personalities you can find, and MBAs from top schools are even more so. So anytime anybody from the front of the room makes a statement A, very bright people immediately start thinking under what set of circumstances is not A the correct answer. Don't do that. I am freely and candidly revealing to you that everything I am going to share with you today is false. So there's no point in asking yourself if it's true or not, because it just truly it isn't. You push hard enough, you penetrate deep enough, all the models I'm sharing with you are going to crumple. What you don't recognize is the models that you are presently using, which you have not subjected to the same scrutiny, are equally false. So the right question to ask yourself is, don't ask yourself if it's true or false, good or bad, right or wrong. Ask yourself, does this work for me in my life better than what I am presently using? Got that? Does it work for me in my life now 
better than what I'm presently using? And if the answer to that is yes, then you adopt it, you modify it, tinker with it, make it uniquely your own, and use it. And if the answer to that is no, just drop it and go ahead, go on to the next one. Don't bother judging it. Does that sound fair? That's what I'm going to ask you to do. OK. <clears throat> the next concept I want to share with you is that of the me-centered universe. And we have a habit of behaving as if Galileo got it wrong. Remember Galileo? He's the guy who kind of postulated that the Earth moves around the sun. All of you guys are personally convinced that Galileo got it wrong. The Earth does not move around the sun. It revolves around you. <laughs> Think about it. No matter what happens, how quickly do you break it down into what's the impact on me? You know, your spouse gets a great job offer, and your reaction is, how is this going to affect our relationship? Your daughter drops out of high school to begin an in-depth exploration of controlled substances. <laughs> and your reaction is, what will they think about my parenting? You know, even when you are driven by what you think is an altruistic thing, you know, there's some tragedy someplace, so you're going to call up and make a donation. And how quickly does it come down to, how dare they keep me on hold for so long? Yes? No. Do you or do you not live in a me-centered universe? No matter what happens, wherever, you very quickly bring it down to what's the impact on me. It is endemic in our culture. So, <clears throat> what I would like to share with you is that if you spend the vast majority of your time living in a me-centered universe, if you live predominantly in a me-centered universe, then you are guaranteed to live a life where anxiety, depression, rejection, ennui are a big part of it. You will live, by and large, a mediocre existence. That's just the way it is. Now, normally, when I give a talk like this, I begin by describing what I mean by an ideal life. And in this case, I'm going to spend a very short time on it, because Vision did a pretty good job in terms of describing what awesomeness is all about. So in my vision for you, I have it that when you wake up in the morning, your blood is singing at the thought of being who you are and doing what you do. You know, you come radiantly alive many times during the day. You have a very, very deep sense of purpose and meaning from whatever it is that you do for a living and it happens day after day. It looks as though incredibly fortuitous coincidences happen. You have a feeling that the universe itself is opening up to help you achieve whatever it is you want to. And you are in a variety of different circumstances in your job, in your family, in society, and you accomplish feats that you'd never have dreamt of. And when the time comes for you to depart, you know, you do so joyfully with no regrets. And I'm suggesting that if your life is not like that, and if you don't see clearly that you are heading in that direction, then you are wasting your life. What I would also like to point out to you is what I just described, <clears throat> what Vision pointed out earlier, in uh, the, his introduction to this event, is this is not a pipe dream. Something like that is, I'm not Pollyanna speaking, something like that is achievable. Not only is it achievable, it is achievable by you. And you can get there. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to share with you some of the more powerful exercises that actually you can go off and start applying and actually start measuring your own progress. Cool? All right. <clears throat> Let's talk about happiness. Now, I have a, it, what happens in our culture is we tend to talk about happiness in very trivial terms. We talk about, gee, you know, I had a, 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 my favorite ice cream and I'm happy, or, you know, I went out and... <clears throat> Uh, had a good conversation, so I'm happy. 
And I'm talking about something different. I'm talking about a very, very, very deep feeling of well-being. The knowledge that you are okay. You have always been okay. You will always be okay. In fact, you cannot but be okay. You know, as long as you're in the human condition, stuff will happen. And when stuff happens, you're going to deal with this stuff as needed. But underneath that, that notion that you're okay is always there. And you're kind of anchored in that. That's what I'm talking about. And bearing that in mind, what I would like you to do is I'd like you to take a minute thinking about what do I have to do? What do I have to get in order to be happy? Okay? You can write it down if you want, but... Uh, it's not necessary. Just think about it. Answer it in your own mind. What do I have to get to be happy? And when I actually conduct the program, I put it up on a flip chart, and we spend about an hour on that, and lots of stuff comes up. I put down two things on the whiteboard immediately, and the two things I put down are vast wealth and trophy spouse. And the reason I put down vast wealth and trophy spouse, by the way, is because these are the 800-pound gorillas in the room, but for some reason people feel bashful about acknowledging them, and I save myself a lot of time by putting it up there. In the old days, if you were a millionaire, that was pretty good. These days, if you're a millionaire, you feel positively middle class. So we'll talk about where you have the kind of money that you can have a mansion where you need a golf cart to get to the dining room and stuff like that. So that takes care of vast wealth. And trophy spas, of course, I don't know what your definition of male or female pulchritude is, but we'll put that down and throw in brains on top of that and say, okay. <clears throat> so I've acknowledged the 800-pound gorillas, but there are lots of 400-pound chimps around. So what comes up is stuff like relaxing leisure time, <coughs> interesting friends, uh, children. And when children comes up, you've got to establish whether they're talking presence of or absence of, <laughs> and uh, stuff like that. But what I want you to think about is the following. By the way, we live our lives on that principle. What I would like you to think about, though, is that the question I asked you is a trick question. Because I asked you, what do you have to get in order to be happy. And in, yeah, absolutely right, by the way. In general, whatever you can get, you can also unget. Is that correct? And if you can get something that makes you happy and you can also unget it, then what does it do for your happiness? Well, I'm going to suggest to you that there is nothing that you have to do or get or be in order to be happy. Happiness is hardwired into you. It's part of, your, part of your DNA. It's inbuilt into you. Your nature, your nature is happiness. Now, you're listening very politely, and some of the audiences I go to, they're not quite so polite. And I frequently get asked, well, Professor Rao, let me get this straight. You're saying that there's nothing I have to do good or be to be happy. Yeah. Then how come I'm not express, uh, experiencing my innate self? How am I experiencing uh, my life sucks? And the reason for that is actually very simple. What we have done is we have spent our entire lives learning to be unhappy. And we did that right from kindergarten or even earlier. We have spent our lives learning to be unhappy. And how do we spend our lives learning to be unhappy? Remember, we talked about mental models earlier, and that's the notion we have that this is the way the world works. There is one particular mental model we buy into, and we buy into it with every fiber of our being, and that is the model that we have to get something so we can do something so we can be something. And I have to get a lot of money so I can travel to exotic places like here so I can be happy. I have to be in a relationship so I can have great sex, so I can be happy. These are all variations of the if-then model. And the if-then model states, if this happens, then I will be happy. 
And the primary thing that's different between all of us in this room, except of course for our physical characteristics, is what is the particular if that we are focusing on? And we're all focusing on that. If my business takes off, <clears throat> if my in-laws move to Australia, if my boss had a heart attack, <laughs> if I had a million dollars, so you might, might want to add a few more zeros to that in my bank account, if my kid got into Harvard, take your pick. We're all living, if this happens, then I will be happy. Here's what I'd like you to do. Go back to your life 10 years ago and try to recreate who you were 10 years ago. Okay? Those of you who are in their 20s, go back five years. <laughs> now, when you do that, think of who you were at that time and make a list of what are the things you wanted at that time, because at that time you were a bundle of wants too. And you had a, if this happens or if I get this, I will be happy. Make a list of that. Odds are pretty good that many of the items you had in your list of 10 years ago or five years ago, you now actually have. And it has not made any appreciable difference to your well-being. We've seen that all the time. So how do we react to this? Well, the way we react to it by saying, you know, I thought if I had X, I would be happy, and now I have X, and I see that uh, my well-being hasn't changed. I made a mistake. It's not X I need, it's Y. You know, I thought if I got married, I would be happy. I now recognize that I kind of got married to the wrong person, so the thing to do is start all over again. Elizabeth Taylor is kind of an expert on this one. And that didn't work, so we'll do it again. That's what we do all the time. What we do is we change what we put on the if side of the equation. If this happens, then I will be happy. I realized I made a mistake here, so let me change the if, and I will put something else on that. And that didn't work, so I'll go back and put something else. What we do is we spend all our time rearranging what we put on the if side of the equation. What we do not recognize is the if-then model is fundamentally flawed. Let me repeat that. The model is fundamentally flawed. The model is broken. But instead of recognizing the model is broken, what we do is we change what we put on one side of the equation. That's the reason it doesn't work very well. And that is the reason, that is the way by which we learn to be unhappy. And by the way, how, how do you know that what I'm saying is accurate, it works for you? Well, why don't you test it out with your own experience? How many of you can recall some time, maybe this morning, maybe yesterday, when you were confronted with a scene of such spectacular beauty that it kind of took you outside of yourself to a place of great calm and serenity? You know, all you've got to do is walk out and you'll probably find any of you. Can you recall that? Raise your hands if you can. Virtually all of you can. Have you ever wondered why that happened? That happened because somehow, inexplicably, at that particular instant, you accepted the universe exactly as it was. You know, you didn't go around saying, you know, that is a beautiful rainbow, but it's way off to one side, and if I could move it 200 yards to the right, <laughs> it would be ever so much better. You didn't say that's a beautiful tree in the valley, but there are too many crooked branches, so give me a chainsaw in 20 minutes and I'll make it better. Now, you know, the rainbow off center was fine, the tree with the crooked branches was fine, and the moment you accepted the universe exactly as it is, your habitual wanting self dropped away, and when your habitual wanting self dropped away, you didn't have to do anything to experience the happiness that's an innate part of you. It kind of welled up and overwhelmed you, and I know that's true because all of you still remember it, even though it might have happened days, weeks, years ago. In fact, for many of you, I hope it happened yesterday 
or this morning because we are truly in gorgeous, gorgeous country. Okay? So, <clears throat> what I'm going to suggest to you is that your life right now with all of the problems that you have, more precisely, with all of the problems that you think you have, is every bit as perfect. And the only reason that you're not experiencing the happiness that is an innate part of you is because you are resisting it, or some part of it, with might and main. Doggone it, no, this is not the way I want the universe to be. This is the way I want it to be, and it's not happening. By the way, here's a tip. If it's ever a contest between you and the universe, bet on the universe every time. <laughs> How many of you have noticed that the universe does not seem to pay a whole lot of attention to what it is that you want to have happen? You all noticed that, right? But we are very busy saying, hey, this is it. This is the way it's got to be. And as you fight what you are being given, you buy into the if-then model, if the universe changes so that it fits into my rigid view, so this is how things should be, then I will be happy. And as I just pointed out, the if-then model is fundamentally flawed. That's how we learn to be unhappy. <clears throat> this is a simple concept, but let me tell you, the ramifications are pretty huge. And let me share some of them with you. And after I've done that, I'm going to go even further, which I have never done in a public uh, talk before. <clears throat> All of you folks are very polite, and uh, some of the audiences that I am before are a little more uh, strident. And I remember there was a, a student from one of the top uh, MBA programs who stuck his hand up and said, Professor Rao, let me get this straight. You're saying there's nothing I have to do, get or be, to be happy. Yeah, happiness is my innate nature, yeah. Okay, so, uh, by the way, he wasn't being a smart aleck. He was genuinely curious. You know, he was pushing it to see where it would go. So from now on, things are going to be different. You know, tomorrow morning, the alarm's going to ring, and I'm going to hit the snooze button. And then forget about the snooze button. I'm going to throw the clock out of the window. And from now on, my life is going to be different. And beer and girls and football are going to figure very prominently. And going to classes or working, uh, <coughs> interviewing for a job are not going to figure. Why do I need to do all of that? You know, there's nothing I have to do, get, or be to be happy. Is that going to work? <coughs> and the answer to that is yes. Yes, it is going to work. It is going to work if you occupy a particular emotional domain. And to illustrate what I mean by a particular emotional domain, let me tell you a story. <clears throat> when Sri Ramakrishna, do any of you know who Sri Ramakrishna was? He was a sage who lived in India in the late 19th century. He was a realized soul. When he died, his disciples kind of scattered and you know, went all over. And one of them, his name was Rakhal, he later became famous as Swami Brahmananda, was going towards Varanasi, which is a holy Indian city, and it was cold, and he hadn't eaten for a number of days, and all of a sudden he couldn't walk anymore. So he lay down. And he thought that he was going to die. He was okay with that, no big deal. Body comes, body goes. And, uh, you know, he just lay down and closed his eyes. And as he did that, somebody was walking behind and said, ah, oh, holy man, he's lying down, must be cold. And he had a very expensive shawl, and he took it off and covered Swami Brahmananda with it. And Swami Brahmananda observed that and started giving thanks to the Lord, saying, hey, isn't it wonderful? Here I am feeling cold, and the universe provided me with a beautiful shawl. And even as he was doing that, the next person came down and said, ah, expensive shawl, guy seems asleep, and the shawl vanished. And Swami Brahmananda burst out laughing. He said, isn't this wonderful, such as the play of the universe, even as I was giving thanks for getting a shawl when I was cold, the shawl vanished. And he had a jolly chuckle. If that is the emotional domain that you are occupying, then yes, it will work for you to do nothing. 
but I would humbly suggest that none of us are in that domain and therefore no, it will not work for us. Here is what will work for us. All of us have a pretty clear idea, or if not a pretty clear idea, at least a somewhat fuzzy clear idea, that this is the way the world should be. And in your notion of this is the way the world should be, there is a big role for you, maybe even a starring role for you. You know, here's how I should be in terms of the amount of money I have, in terms of the work that I do, in terms of the respect in which I'm held by colleagues, a whole, whole bunch of things like that. And you have a vision of the world, and there is a big role for you in your vision of the world, and you do have it. As long as you have such a vision, it is incumbent upon you to try to make that happen with every fiber of your being. You've got a vision of the world, go make it happen. Invest yourself completely into it. But what you do is don't invest in it with the idea, if this happens, then I will be happy. Invest in it with the notion, if this happens, wonderful. If it does not happen, still wonderful. It in no way has an impact upon your well-being. And this is a learnable skill. It is no different from riding to learn a <coughs> learning to ride a bicycle. It's something that you can cultivate in yourself. And it is a hugely important practice. From a young age, we are taught we've got to have goals. You know, you are a kid, you set yourself goals. You want to go off and do well in school, because if you do well in school, you can go to a good graduate school. If you go to a good graduate school, you can go off and get a good job, or you know, you'll learn the stuff that you need to become an entrepreneur. If you become an entrepreneur, then you have to boost up sales and do stuff. So we're always taught that we have to have goals, correct? Now, have any of you noticed that actions are within your control? but the outcome is not within your control. Any of you notice that? Right? I'll tell you a funny story about that. There was an Indian Swami, and you know, in India, the tradition is that if you have a Swami who's a holy man, uh, it is considered an honor and a privilege if you can invite him to your home and you know, feed him and give a meal. So there was a Swami, and he was invited to a family, and they gave him a plate of food. And <clears throat> in that plate, he noticed that there was a uh, karela. Karela is bitter gourd, it's an Indian vegetable, and he really didn't like karela. So it was given to him in a plate, and when you're given food, it's not considered good manners to waste it. So he thought, you know what I'm going to do? There's only a little karela. Why don't I eat it up first so I'll get done with it, and then I can enjoy the rest of the food. So he ate up the karela. <clears throat> and the housewife was watching with an eye like a hawk. He said, he ate the karela, he must like it. And before he could say anything, another big <laughs> of karela came up on his plate. <laughs> he ate it with difficulty, but the story didn't end there because, you know, they have an informal whisper <clears throat> uh, net among housewives. So the next one said, you know, Swami is coming to my house. I know he came to your house. What does he like? Oh, he likes karela. He ate it first thing. <laughs> So wherever he went, he got Karela. And eventually he just said, I started liking it, didn't have a choice. Perfect illustration of actions are within your control, the outcome is, is not. If you look at your life, you will find that you have a goal, you try to achieve it, some of the time you succeeded, much of the time you did not succeed, and at least some of the time you achieved a result which was diametrically opposed to what you wanted, as happened in the story of the Swami that I just told you. Is that true? In your life, think about it. So what happens if you live your life on the if-then principle? And the if-then principle says, if this happens, I will be happy. You know, I have a goal, and I'm going to work hard to achieve my goal. And if I do achieve it, then I have succeeded. Life is fine. But if I don't, I failed. 
That's the life that most of us live. And if that is the life that you live, you are, it's a built-in recipe for feeling down, feeling dejected, depressed much of the time. It is not a good way to go. And this happens because we have been indoctrinated into focusing on the outcome. We are a very goal-oriented society. I work with a number of companies, and there is no company that I work with which does not have a goal. In fact, many companies now no longer have goals. They have stretch goals. And some of them are just moving on to super stretch goals, you know, because we have these people, they're very high potential people, and stretch goals are not good enough for them. They've got to have super stretch goals. And all on the same principle, you know, if you do, fine, and if you don't, gone. <clears throat> I'm not saying don't have goals, because as human beings, that's kind of inbuilt into our psyches. We cannot live without something that we are striving for. But what I am saying is that what you can do is focus on goals only to the extent that it gives you direction. Once the direction has been given, forget about them altogether. Then what you do is put every fiber of your being into what do you have to do to accomplish the goals you set up. Invest in the process, do not invest in the outcome. And a funny thing happens when you start investing in the process, not in the outcome. And the funny thing is, first of all, you really start enjoying your life. You know the vision that I laid out for you earlier, the vision that Vision laid out to you? How would life be if every day you got up and said, hey, you know, am I there yet? What is important is you know that this is the direction you want to be going. Are you closer there than you were before? And when you start investing in the process, you start enjoying the journey. When you are obsessively focused on the outcome, you are looking at the destination, you will miss the journey. And I don't have to tell you, the journey is all that you have. It's uh, <clears throat> one of the best quotes on this that I've come across is by John Wooden. And uh, many of you are probably familiar with him. For those of, of you who are not, John Wooden was the first person to make the Basketball Hall of Fame both as a player and as a coach. And he led UCLA to an unprecedented number of NCAA victories and appearances in the final. And what he said was, whenever I start working with a new team, I never talk about winning or outscoring opponents. I always talk about when it's over and you look in the mirror, did you do the best that you were capable of? If you did the best that you were capable of, then the score really doesn't matter. But if you did the best that you were capable of, I suspect you will find the score to your liking. That is a perfect example of investing in the process, not the outcome. This, by the way, has ramifications which still have to sink in. And I remember there was a senior executive in one of my programs, and he was actually working for a Fortune 50 firm. And he was responsible for all the sales of his firm in Europe, the Middle East, Africa, Australia. In fact, a big chunk of the world outside the United States. He said, Professor Rao, let me get this straight. You know, <clears throat> I work in a company. I have to meet my numbers. And if I get up tomorrow and say, say, hey, guys, the outcome doesn't matter, my boss is not likely to be very thrilled. <clears throat> First of all, when I said the outcome doesn't matter, I'm not advocating that you stand up and uh, on a chair and uh, broadcast that to your people. That is not a career-enhancing strategy. This is something for you to know. But here's how it plays out. As I told him, look, you know, you've got a choice. You have numbers and you didn't meet. You're not going to make it. Is that correct? He said, yeah. 
So you can do what you normally would have done, and what you normally would have done is, you know, go into a, a, a tizzy and, you know, point blame and uh, have crisis meetings and generally go into a downward spiral, or you can simply accept the fact that you didn't make your numbers. As a result of your not making your numbers, stuff could happen up to and including your involuntary separation from your position. Could get fired. If that happens, you'll deal with it when it happens. But for the time being, why don't you accept you're not going to meet the numbers. Tomorrow will be another day. You'll deal with it when it comes. And deal with what you can do. Invest in the process. I said, okay, that makes sense. He sat, sat together with his team. And he went over to his boss the next day and said, hey, boss, we're not going to make our numbers. I don't know what the shortfall is, but this is the order of magnitude. And here's what I propose to do about it. And he presented some revenue enhancement measures, some cost containment measures, and some let's restructure and see what happens uh, <coughs> methods. And the boss looked at it and said, yeah, these were unusual business conditions. I said, sure, you know, that sounds reasonable. Why don't you go do it? So what could have been a major derailment turned out to be a minor bump in the road. Think about that in your own life when you're going through. When you are focusing obsessively, obsessively on the outcome, you are missing the journey. And the journey is all that you have. Let's go over, now we're getting into some deeper territory. Another of the things that we do which contributes greatly to our not being well, is we identify with the character and not the actor. And if you've seen Death of a Salesman, do you know the story of Death of the Salesman? There's the salesman, there's Willie Loman, and one time he was reasonably successful, and then he was not so successful, and things started going to down in a handbasket. And uh, his marriage was breaking off, his uh, uh, <clears throat> relationships, his family was det were deteriorating, he actually tried to commit suicide. Now imagine that you are playing Willie Loman. Do you really want to get into it? You know, you'll be the most miserable Willie Loman that they could be. And as you're doing that, in the back of your mind, there is the notion, hey, you know, if I am a sufficiently miserable Willie Loman, maybe there might be a, an Academy Award nomination for me. Maybe even an Oscar. So you get into it with Wim and Vigor, correct? Or you're a father playing with his kid, and the kid wants to be a a cop and he beats up on the robber and you being the father are the robber so he pushes you and kicks you and pummels you and you really look scared and you get into it as much as you can. That's fine, right? You're a father playing with a son. The reason that this works is because you are identifying with the actor, not the character. What happens in your real life is you think, oh, here is me, and all of these things are happening to me, and oh, woe is me, and you are identifying with the character and not the actor, because you're not the person to whom all of this stuff is happening. Let me explain. <clears throat> Now we're going to some really heavy stuff. You ready for that? Okay. <clears throat> going back to Aristotelian, Aristotelian philosophy, everything that happens, there's an efficient cause and a material cause. And the efficient cause is the person who actually makes it, and the material cause is what did he make it with. So you have the statue of David, and the efficient cause is Michelangelo, and the material cause is marble. You have a gold ornament, and the efficient cause is the goldsmith, and the material cause is gold, and works across the board. You know, you have an automobile, and the efficient cause is General Motors, and the material cause is rubber, steel, 
<coughs> glass and so on, all clear. Now you have this wonderful thing called the universe. You know, there's the Earth, there's the Sun, the solar system, there are galaxies floating all around. Who made it? God made it, right? Now we have the interesting question. What did God make the universe out of? Well, you know, he kind of made it out of some quantum soup, which consisted of uh, <coughs> subatomic particles, quarks, bosons, gauge bosons, leptons. Who made the quantum soup? Do you see that this takes you into an infinite regress? Now, this is where I got to tell you what happens is we're going to use your intellect to get you a great deal of the way. But the problem with the intellect is it cannot get you all the way. The intellect is like a car. You know, you want to go visit your friend, and you get in the car, and you drive up to his house, and the car will get you up to the house. It might even get you into the driveway. But after you get into the driveway, you've got to leave the car to enter the house and meet your friend, right? The intellect is like that. It's the car. It'll get you halfway through not all the way. You have to transcend the intellect if you're going to go all the way. So we use the intellect right now. Do you understand that you get caught into an infinite regress if you ask who made the quantum soup, correct? There is only one way out of the regress. God made the universe out of himself, herself, itself. Which means that each one of you is God's stuff. You, me, the chair in which you're sitting, the projector up there, the microphone, everything is God's stuff. The evildoers of history, Hitler, Stalin, Pol Pot, the great figures of history, Lincoln, Gandhi, Mandela, all God's stuff. Everything's God's stuff. Think about that for a minute. Have you heard about in every tradition we have this feeling of mystical unity, the feeling of wholeness? That feeling of wholeness is the recognition that that is all there is in the world. There has never been, there is not now, and there will not be ever anything which is not God's stuff. And you are a part of that, an intrinsic part of that. Now, this is very easy to understand intellectually, as I've just pointed it out to you. It requires a leap beyond intuition to make that a part of who you actually are. But if that is what you're anchored in, then the way in which you relate to others changes and it changes quite dramatically. Because what happens, and this is something that I've noticed with senior executives, with entrepreneurs, is we tend to relate to people as mechanisms. You have an entrepreneur talking to your employee, and he's looking at the employee from, here is what I want this person to do, and why isn't he doing it in the manner I would have done it, and not come bothering me with all of these petty concerns. You tend to be, and especially when life is hectic, which is a lot of the time, you become more granular, you tend to look at people as mechanisms for accomplishing something that you, with your ego, want to have happen. But if instead you are anchored in, there is God's stuff in me, there is God's stuff in this person, and your attitude is, what is it that I can do to raise the level of consciousness of this person? Think about that. Every time you're in a company, you're up here, you do run into people. Some of those meetings are 30 seconds. Some of them could be two minutes. Some of them could be extended uh, associations. Happens all the time, right? What is the underlying intention in you when you go into an interaction. 
If the underlying interaction is you treat people as mechanisms because they can give you or get you something that you want, you're demeaning the transaction. But if your underlying attitude is, yes, let me be of service, what is it that I can do to get this person to a higher level of consciousness, and the way you get a person to a higher level of consciousness is in being at that level yourself, then it completely changes the nature of the interaction and, the, and what you, you know, what both of you get out of it. And I'm inviting you to think, of the, think about what is it that you anchor yourself in? And if you anchor yourself in the knowledge that you are part of this incredible, you know, God is a loaded term, so I don't want to use that. You are part of the fabric of universe. That is what I mean when I say that there is nothing in the world you cannot achieve, quite literally. At the third level. And let me explain what I mean by a third level. Supposing you say, and you know, I've been challenged enough time. Professor Rao, you say there's nothing in the world I can't, uh, I can't achieve. And you know, I want to be Wimbledon champion, and this guy next to me also wants to be Wimbledon champion. Tell me how we can both be Wimbledon champions. Well, first of all, neither of you is going to be Wimbledon champion. The only way you're going to get to Wimbledon is if you buy a ticket early. But that aside, why do you want? That's the first level, by the way. I want to be Wimbledon champion. The next level down is, why do you want to be a Wimbledon champion? What does it mean to you? Does it mean money? Does it mean uh, fame? What is it that you are looking for to be Wimbledon champion? And then the third level is, what is the lack in me that leads me to want that? It is at the third level that you can have anything you want. Because all of us are going under the impression that we are incomplete. We are not full. We need something to make us full, whether it is a relationship, whether it is more money, whether it is success as we define it. We need that to become full. And I'm saying you don't need that to become full. You are a part an integral part of the universe. There is God stuff in you with everyone else. You are intrinsically full. So whatever action you take, take it from that fullness. Have any of you had the experience, you're taking a long warm shower and you know, life feels good and all of a sudden they're, you're feeling so good you burst out spontaneously in song. Happened? Do you sing because you want to be happy? Now you sing because you are happy. It is a spontaneous outburst. In exactly the same way, all of the stuff you do, the businesses that you run, the causes that you undertake, the relationships that you go in, can be a spontaneous outburst of the fullness that you already are. And that is what I want to leave you with. That is how life can be and should be, and it doesn't matter whether you get there. Don't obsess on, am I there yet? Just obsess on, this is a vision. I'm going to move towards that, and am I closer there today than I was yesterday? And when you do that, you know, you'll get to the awesomeness that Vision talked about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.